Okay, so second talk this afternoon by Michael Pushnik from University X Marseille. Uh, the title is Convolution Algebras Attached to Hyperbolic Groups. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much to all the organizers for inviting me to talk here. Um, it was suggested that I talk about some convolution algebras attached to hyperbolic groups, which have found applications in geometric analysis, as you might have um, noticed when you heard the talks of Gu Liang Yu and of Paul Piazza, maybe. So now I have to see that my, okay, I, okay, I have to do it this way. Um, so I'm going to talk about holomorphically closed subalgebras of Banach algebras. Uh, just to recall the definition, uh, we call a dense subalgebra A of a Banach algebra B holomorphically closed clo or closed under holomorphic functional calculus if spec elements of the subalgebra A have the same spectrum in the algebra A and in B. Um, now, this is a priori a technical condition, but it turned out to be quite important in non-commutative geometry for two reasons. Reason number one, one is in K-theory of operator algebras, mainly interested in studying K-theory of C-star algebras. These turn often out to be too big to be studied directly. And it's a first step towards calculation to find a nice holomorphically closed subalgebra because one knows uh, that holomorphically closed subalgebra have the same K-theory. Second reason is cyclic cohomology, the topic of this conference. Uh, as you, uh, we all know, cyclic cohomology uh, has its origin as a generalization of the Durham cohomology and the Durham complex. And this Durham cohomology works for a smooth manifold and is formulated and defined in terms of smooth functions on a manifold and not in terms of the continuous function on the underlying topological space, which uh, give the C-star algebra in question. So there one has to find a holomorphically or isospectral subalgebra, the smooth functions, the algebra of smooth functions on a manifold, just before one may start to study cyclic cohomology. And that's the general strategy. Usually, Banach algebras are too big to admit interesting cyclic cohomology. One, if one is lucky, one finds a holomorphically closed subalgebra. And if one is even more lucky, this holomorphically closed subalgebra admits interesting cyclic cohomology. And because the k theory of the subalgebra is the same as the k theory of the C algebra, the cyclic cocycles or cohomology classes one has constructed provide a pairing with K-theory and therefore functionals on K-theory. So this is an important problem to find such algebras. Now, in this talk, we will deal with completion of group rings. And for completions of group rings, there is another class of important algebras or spaces um, that one uh, is interested in, the so-called unconditional ones. This means that the Banach algebra we start, we, we study, or the Frechet algebras we studied, are obtained by completion with respect to unconditional norms. So unconditional means that if we have two elements in the group ring, and the absolute value of the coefficients of the element A are just less or equal the absolute values of the coefficients of B, we get the corresponding inequality in norm. So, I mean, this is clearly the case for all LP spaces, LP of gamma, but this is clearly wrong for the group C-star algebra. And this is quite rare to find unconditional convolution algebras apart from L1 or algebras directly uh, obtained from L1. Okay. And an result, a theorem which has been used by many people in non-commutative geometry is this theorem of Hall group, Hall group for the free group, and then Jolie Saint for word hyperbolic groups. Namely, they show that for a word hyperbolic group, the uh, 
space of little L2 functions of rapid decay with a word metric, word length on gamma, form a convolution algebra. And this convolution algebra is clearly unconditional because it is defined in terms of growth conditions on the coefficients. And it is closed under holomorphic functional calculus, even in the reduced group C star algebra. So that's really a um, quite deep and important um, result that has been uh, used by many people since. Um, now, <clears throat> how has it been used to attack uh, uh, problems in cyclic cohomology and K-theory? Now, a first observation, I mean, this is, this is trivial, but, but um, we'll come to, back to it in a moment, namely the, the, just the canonical trace on the group ring, which extends, of course, to the C star group, reduced group C star algebra, restricts to a trace on this subalgebra of the group C star algebra. But traces are just the first examples of cyclical cycles. And things get much more interesting when we look at the continuous periodic cyclic homology or cohomology of the Jolissin algebra. And there, Kohn and Moscovici observe. And this is an elementary observation once you have the theorem of Jolissin, but it's a very important one in their paper on the Novikov conjecture for hyperbolic groups. Um, to see that, first of all, the part of the analytic, you know, of, of the periodic cyclic by complex of L2 functions of rapid decay, which corresponds to the conjugacy class of the unit. I mean, we saw this in the talk of Victor today that cyclic complexes of a group rings tend split as direct sums of contributions of the conjugacy class. Now, now here, the contribution of the conjugacy class of unit is in fact a direct semant of the periodic cyclic complex of this, bun, this uh, Frechet algebra. And moreover, this summand actually coincides with the corresponding summand of L1, which is much simpler to control. And this is used by Kohn and Moscovici to prove the Novikov conjecture in the following way. Suppose you have a bounded group co-cycle on, on, on your group. I mean, on a hyperbolic groups, we know that every cohomology class in degree bigger than one can be uh, represented by a bounded co-cycle then it will give a bounded linear functional here on L1, on the complex of uh, uh, cyclic complex of L1, because it is bounded. But this equals to this complex. This complex being a direct semant, we may prolongate uh, the linear functional here to a linear functional there. And that's how we get produced cyclic co-cycles that pair non-trivially with K-theory. OK, fine. So this was the use. <clears throat> of Kohn and Moscovici of the fact that the summit of the trivial conjugacy of the conjugacy class one splits off the periodic cyclic complex of this Banach algebra. Unfortunately, this is not true for other conjugacy classes. Just take the free group on two generators. It's a simple exercise, you write down the expressions, you see there is no chance to split off other sum, summons to, uh, corresponding to other conjugacy classes. And also it is not possible to obtain other traces than the canonical trace uh, that extends extend to traces on this Frechet algebra. So this is difficult, but one would actually wish to have traces on other conjugacy classes than the unit which extend to this algebra and uh, also cyclic cocycles, because such traces are needed in cyclic cocycles to study delocalized invariants of elliptic operators like lots delocalized torsion, eta invariants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Bu Liang and uh, Paolo Piazza already talked about this. So one is interested to extend these results to other conjugacy classes. And here is the result I want to talk about. Um, Namely, when you have a word hyperbolic group, there exists an unconditional Frechet algebra, like the algebra of Jolissin and Hogg group, which is holomorphically closed 
in the latter one and therefore holomorphically closed in the group C star algebra. And such that when you restrict elements here to conjugacy classes, you get functions which are only in L1 of rapid decay. Yeah. And so you may define lots of traces on these algebras. Because for every conjugacy class, so you have functions, these are fun given, these elements here are given by functions on the group, which are globally L2, but restricted to every conjugacy classes, they are L1. Yeah. And therefore, there are lots of traces. I will say later what a temper trace is. And also the contribution of a given conjugacy class in the analytic cyclic by complex of this Frechet algebra splits off as a direct sum end of the whole analytic cyclic by complex. Fine. Now, um, what is the usual way to construct isospectral or holomorphically closed subalgebras? They are usually obtained as domains of unbounded, densely defined, and closable derivations on a given Banach algebra. So the domain of such an unbounded, densely defined, closable derivation closed in the graph norm will give us a holomorphically closed subalgebra. The archetypical examples is the algebra of smooth functions on a manifold. There you take a C star algebra, the continuous functions, and as unbounded derivations, I mean the derivations you get from vector fields on the manifold. However, in our case, <clears throat> where we study completions of group algebras, it may turn out to be difficult to find interesting derivation. I want just to give you to indicate a, a reason why this could be uh, this could be difficult, namely. We have a completion of the group ring, kind of the group C star algebra or something else. We look for a derivation defined on the group algebra because this is the natural domain. Now, a derivation on the group algebra with values in some Banach by module, it has to be a Banach by module because we are working in a Banach algebra. So, a derivation with values in a Banach by module gives you a class in HH1, the first Hochschild cohomology of the group ring with values in this by module. But this is, this is the same as a group cohomology class H1 of gamma with the corresponding adjoint module. So you look for one co-cycles of a discrete group with values in Banach modules. And for example, if your group has property T, you know that all that such cohomology classes with values in, 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 in unitary, unitary representations will vanish or if you have a, a group like a higher rank lattice, which has a strengthened property T, you know that H1 of gamma with coefficients in many Banach modules vanishes. So this means that whatever derivation you come up, it will be an inner derivation, so it is bounded. So the procedure gives you nothing. It gives you back the full algebra. So one has to look maybe for other methods to find holomorphically closed subalgebras. I should mention that there is an other method known since a long time uh, due to Jean-Benoit Bost, but it is rarely applicable in concrete situations. Okay, let me now remind you how one proves that the domain of an unbounded density defined derivation is holomorphically closed. Actually, you have to prove the following statement. Take an element in the domain of your derivation, which is in the unit ball of the Banach algebra, then one minus A inverse is in the domain of the derivation. And this is simple to prove. You have to prove that you may derive these elements. So you derive here each term. It gives you, so to say, a single term just becomes N terms. And these N terms consist of a product of N minus one elements A and one element which is delta of A. So these N minus one, N minus one elements A give you an exponential factor of exponential decay because the norm of A is smaller than one and times a polynomial growth. So altogether, this converges. Very simple exercise. Uh, and when you look what you used in this argument, it is only this inequality which is here, namely the norm of the derivative of AB is just small or equal to a constant times the norm of delta of A times the norm of B plus the norm of A times the norm of delta B. Okay, so trivial, so good. 
Now, Kunz and Blechadar made the following elementary but, uh, but important observation that all you need in the argument that the domain of this operator delta uh, gave a holomorphically closed subalgebra was this inequality. Yeah, take any operator satisfying star, then the closure of the graph in the graph norm is holomorphically closed in A. And the next observation is, and the remark is, every derivation satisfies this inequality, but not vice versa. Yeah, there may be operators coming up somewhere with values in a Banach space. Yeah, they don't have to have value take values in a module. It suffices that you have that you come up with an interesting operator starting on a dense subalgebra of the algebra you start from values in the Banach space satisfies this. Suddenly you have a holomorphically closed subalgebra. And that's what we are going to do. We will look for an operator which is not a derivation, which is not even at finite distance in any reasonable sense from a derivation, but which will satisfy this inequality. And surprisingly enough, the operator we will study is well defined for every finitely generated group, but this condition, and it, this I would say kunz plakada condition, because they noticed its significance, this kunz plakada condition will essentially be equivalent to our group to be hyperbolic. Yeah, So it's in some sense an analytic manifestation of hyperbolicity, this inequality. So let's first of all, look at the operator we study and then look at its properties for hyperbolic groups. Now the operator here is a geodesic splitting operator. This means for a given finitely presented, finitely generated group, excuse me, I look at splittings of elements of G. So I look at all possible splittings, I sum up splittings of G into K plus one elements, G zero to GK, whose product is G itself. But I ask that the length of the elements add up to the length of G. So when you have a look in the Cayley graph, this means that I, so unfortunately I'm unable to, to am I, no, I'm, un, ah, maybe I can even draw it, so very good. So in the Cayley graph, an element G, will be represented just by a geodesic. And what do I do with these operators? They just cut the geodesic into pieces. There's another piece, tens or another piece, and that's the operator what I look at. So as an operator, it is very, very simple indeed, but there are tensor products here coming up and tensor product can be very subtle in a topological context. Okay. So what can we say about this operator? Okay, I have to scroll it here like this. Uh, excuse, excuse me, yeah, here. I mean, the first of these operators just is the operator cutting a geodesic into two pieces and it defines actually a co-multiplication on the grouping which is co-associative and the other cutting operators we have here are just iterations of the co-product, fine. So these are the operators we are going to study, but we need densely defined operators with values in some Banach space or even better, densely defined operators with values in a bimodule over the Banach algebra we study. So this now raises the question that this operator becomes interesting once we, once it has, takes values in a Banach bimodule, so we have to complete this. Yeah, and as I said, there are many interesting tensor products, uh, many interesting norms on tensor products, excuse me. And so we will choose an appropriate norm. And note, if I take here a Banach space of completion, which is very large, I will get a domain of this operator, which is large. And this is not what I'm interested in. I want a small holomorphically closed subalgebra. So I look for small completions of this. The straightforward thing would be to take the projective tensor norm, cross norm, but this is not a good idea because we lose immediately the property of being unconditional. Little example, 
Suppose that, look at the Hilbert space little L2 of gamma. This is an unconditional completion of, of the group ring, but little L2 of gamma projective tensor product with little L2 of gamma gives the trace class operators on the Hilbert space L2 of gamma. And this is by no means an unconditional completion. So we look for a smallest unconditional completion. And here it is. There is, in fact, if you start with two unconditional Banach algebras or normed spaces over a group ring, there is a maximal unconditional cross norm, namely to uh, the unconditional norm of some element gamma in the algebraic tensor product of A and B is given as follows. You take an infimum, and the infimum is taken over a set. Uh, <clears throat> over the set of all elements in the algebraic tensor product, okay, which do not give gamma, but which are bigger than gamma in the sense that when I pass to absolute values of the coefficients of these elements in the group algebra, the corresponding element of the group ring of gamma cross gamma, which I get, have satisfied these relations. Okay, I should reformulate the sentence because it made no sense. I do the following. I start with an element gamma <clears throat> in the algebraic tensor product of A and B. I look for all other elements in the algebraic tensor product, which have the, they have the property that if I take absolute values of the coefficients of gamma, absolute values of the coefficients of alpha and of beta, I get these inequality pointwise, where I view these as functions on <clears throat> gamma cross gamma. Okay, I take the infimum of these expressions and it's immediate to see that all unconditional norms, um, uh, cross norms uh, will be bounded by this expression and it's itself is an unconditional cross norm. So this is the norm we are interested in. Now comes the key proposition, uh, which is so to say the starting point of this work, namely, when you start with a vert hyperbolic group and consider any unconditional Banach algebra over it, so to say any unconditional completion of the group ring with respect to an unconditional norm, which yields a Banach algebra, then the splitting operator, which just splits <clears throat> a given um, group element G, into two elements V who multiply up to G and such the length of U plus length of V is G. So if you just take the operator which splits all possible geodesics from one to G in the Kelly graph into two pieces, this operator satisfy the kunz placarda condition. And let us show why. And I, first of all, <clears throat> I have here a corollary, excuse me. So the corollary is now from the work of Blackadar Kunz, namely, if gamma is a word hyperbolic group and we have an unconditional Banach algebra over it. And if I take just the graph norms of all the splitting operators of splitting geodesics in the Cayley graph into many, many pieces. And if I take here, the unconditional tensor power of a gamma as the target of this densely defined um, map, then closure in the graph norms yields a holomorphically closed subalgebra of a gamma, which is unconditional. And, and this is the important point, the splitting operator extends to this, um, <clears throat> this um, holomorphically closed subalgebra of a gamma. Yeah, and the splitting here takes place in the unconditional tensor product again. Fine. Now I want to come back to this proposition and explain why it satisfies the Black Kunz condition. So the Black Kunz condition, we will see it in a moment. Um, oh yeah, here's the proof. Okay, of the proposition. Excuse me, I'll do one step before the other. Okay, so in the proof, we look at a delta hyperbolic group, and we will make use of an average operator, the tensor product. Namely, what does it do? 
whenever we have a pair of points of elements, group elements G and H, whose product gives GH, you will sum of all other pairs of group elements whose product is the same as the product here, namely GH, and which are delta close to this couple. So you sum over all group elements of length less or equal to delta and over these elements. This gives a bounded linear operator, not only on the projective, but also on the unconditional tensor square of any unconditional Banach algebra. Okay, now comes the key observation. And maybe we go back to the Kunz Blackadar condition, then you see that it is close to this. Here it is. This is the Kunz Blackadar condition. So the linear operator under consideration should behave in norm like a derivation. And we want to show this for this operator on the group ring. And first we will show it for monomials, for single group elements. So we have to show that the value of the splitting operator on a product GH is, gives an element in the group ring of gamma cross gamma of positive coefficients which are bounded by the coefficients of this element in the group of gamma cross gamma, namely splittings of G times H plus G times splitting of H, you see here, something which reminds of a derivation. And afterwards we have an, an average, but which is a bounded operator and doesn't, is not dramatic. So we want to show this inequality. And we do it by having a look at the Cayley graph of the group. Here is again the inequality we want to show. And let's look at these triangles. So it's two times the same triangle. We start with a point in the Cayley graph. We multiply by H and pick a minimal word representing of H. This gives us a geodesic segment here. Then we multiply here this point or this element with G arrive here and pick a geodesic here, which corresponds to a minimal word representing G. Okay, so that's the setup. Now we look at this inequality to be proved. Now the splitting operator applied to the product GH provides us with a sum of pairs of elements. What do we know about these elements? Their product is GH, and the length of u plus the length of v is the length of gh. So this means that u and v appear of segments in a geodesic joining these two points. Yeah, All pairs u and v appear in this way. And we want now control them in terms of the splitting of g and splitting of h. But what means hyperbolicity? And now hyperbolicity comes in. It means that every point on a geodesic in a triangle is delta close to a point on one of the other um, sides of the triangle. So we have two cases to consider. Case number one, we have a splitting of GH into UV, where the point where we have cut the geodesic is delta close to this side. Okay, but the point which is delta close gives us now a splitting of G. So we get now a non-geodesic splitting of GH by the elements G prime, we go up to here, and a G prime prime H, which reaches here. But what means G prime on the one hand and G prime prime H on the other? It means this is just one summon in delta of G, the splitting of G times H. And if we average over delta, this means we spread this out over a delta disk, then we see that we cover also this point. So the characteristic function of this point will be less or equal to this function here, where we take the first sum. Now, second case, the splitting takes place here you of, of, of this geodesic by u and v at a point which is delta close to this side. But then again, we have a geodesic splitting of the element h into h prime, h prime prime. 
and this gives us a non-geodesic splitting of GH into GH prime times H prime prime. It means it splitting here, yeah, G times the splitting of H, and then the average. So fine, we have established this inequality. Now we may, of course, multiply the elements U, uh, sorry, excuse me, G and H in the group with positive real constants. And we made some up over inequality of this, ty this type. And we get from this, the fact that just this element in the group ring of gamma cross gamma, which has positive coefficients is bigger than that one. This is just what we obtained here. And now this is a trivial inequality, which says that just the coefficients of the absolute value of the coefficients of AB is just less or equal the uh, uh, coefficients of this um, element of the group ring. Fine. So up to now, we just have an inequality of functions on gamma cross gamma, if you want. But if we take an unconditional norm, we get the corresponding inequality of the norms. And here we have the Kuntz Blackadder condition. OK, so we achieved our construction. We have now some new holomorphically closed subalgebra of any Banach unconditional Banach algebra of a group ring of a hyperbolic group. In particular, we have interesting new holomorphically closed subalgebra of the Cholissa algebra. Look for examples. Let us look for examples. Now, we can play this game with any group if we start from L1 of gamma, but we get nothing interesting. We get just the L1 functions of rapid decay. This is because this topological tensor product is not interesting. It gives just us L1 over powers of gamma. But for hyperbolic groups, something much more interesting happens. Namely, here we look at functions of rapid, of L2 functions of rapid decay. And if we just fix one of these norms for sufficiently large k, it will be submultiplicative. So we get an unconditional Banach algebra. And to this, we may apply the procedure we did. And the holomorphically closed subalgebra A infinity we get are these are the algebras used by John Lord, by Paolo Piazza, Thomas Schick, and William Yu and his collaborators in their work in geometric analysis. And the fact that these algebras are interesting comes from the fact that this unconditional tensor product is highly non trivial when you apply it to weighted L2 spaces. Fine. So these for the algebras, this for their structure. And now we want to see how we get traces, because this is what the people in traces or cyclic cycles on it, because this is what the people in geometric analysis want. OK, so here is, <clears throat> from now on, I should say, I will only consider Banach algebras of this type. So I consider unconditional Banach algebras, which are related to the Joly Saha group algebra. And I consider the subalgebra A infinity, which we constructed as the domain or closure of the domain of the geodesic splitting operators. So now for these algebras, we have the following theorem, which gives us information about which traces we can obtain from our construction, namely, let gamma s be a word hyperbolic group, and let conj of gamma be the set of conjugacy classes. Then we have a canonical map, which I call phi, which attaches to a group element each conjugacy class. I take the corresponding linear map on the linear spaces spent by gamma and by the conjugacy classes. And this extends now to a bounded linear operator on the algebra A infinity gamma we constructed to the space of L2 functions, square summable functions of rapid decay on a set of conjugacy classes. And this is now something very nice because I can take any bounded linear functional on this space. I can pull it back and will get a trace because these functions are just the function I get by pullback are exactly the class functions, the functions conjugate, uh, consonant conjugacy classes. 
and I get here information about all the traces I can get by this procedure because I know precisely the dual space to this. So let's formulate uh, this corollary, namely every class function on a hyperbolic group such that when you take its value, when you take the square of its value on a given conjugacy class and you multiply by the word length of a conjugacy class, it means by the length of a minimal length of an element in it times minus 2k. If this sum is infinity, is, is, is finite, excuse me, then this trace on the group ring extends to a bounded trace on the algebra infinity gamma, which is holomorphically closed in the reduced group sister algebra. Yeah? So you may take all, so to say, um, <clears throat> uh, traces which are of moderate growth uh, on the, with respect to the Sobolev norms, you can define on the set of conjugacy classes with the length function. Fine. Uh, now I would like to uh, um, comment on the proof of this theorem. So this theorem says that you start with an element in A infinity gamma, what you do is just you sum over all elements in a conjugacy class, you get a functional on a set of conjugacy classes, and this is still L2 of rapid decay. Now, the idea is, and this is quite straightforward, I would say, to relate this operator to splitting operators. So first of all, I would like to embed this space really into the hogger joli saint space of little L2 functions of gamma of rapid decay. And this can be done isometrically just by choosing a shortest element, sigma of conjugacy class of G in each conjugacy class. And this gives you an isometric embedding. OK. So then our operator of summation of a conjugacy class becomes the operator which sends a group element G just to this shortest element in its conjugacy class. And this operator can be related to a splitting in the following way. Now G is conjugate to any element in its conjugacy class, in particular to this shortest element in it. And this means that we can write G as UV, whereas we can write sigma of the conjugacy class of G as VU for suitable U and V. And we pick such a pair for each group element. It will give us a linear map from C gamma to C gamma tensor C gamma. We apply the switch, we multiply, and we have our operator of summation along, con along conjugacy classes. So all, we, all, all what we have to do still is to uh, show that these operators extend to the completion you consider. Now, this is obvious for the switch map. A little thought shows that it is true for the multiplication. But here is the real problem. It is this splitting operator. And this is not a geodesic one. But again, it is the hyperbolicity of the group with, which helps us. Namely, there is a basic principle in hyperbolic geometry, in the geometry of hyperbolic metric spaces, which tells us that sufficiently long quasi-geodesic segments are uniformly close to geodesic ones. Yeah? Quasi-geodesics are close to geodesics. And this has the following analytic implication. Namely, we may consider instead of a geodesic splitting operator, a quasi-geodesic splitting operator. This means for some fixed R, we consider the splitting of G into products G0, G1, tensor G1, such that G, G0, G1 is still equal to G. But when we sum up the length of G0 and the length of G1, we don't get the length of G, but the length of G plus some constant, which we tolerate. And now this fact in hyperbolic geometry that quasi-geodesics are close to geodesics imply that these quasi-geodesic splitting operators still extend to bounded linear operators on our holomorphically closed freshes of algebra of C-sideus of gamma. Another consequence is 
that the splitting we need to realize the operator of summing along conjugacy classes, the splitting can be done in a quasi-geodesic way. So here, for every element in a hyperbolic group, we can choose u, a pair u and v of group elements such that uv is equal to g, v, v u is equal to a shortest given shortest element in the conjugacy class, and the word length we have here satisfy this inequality. So the splitting is almost geodesic. And therefore, all the operators we have here extend to our holomorphically closed subalgebra. And we get that the map of summing up of A infinity gamma goes here to A infinity gamma, but this A infinity lies inside the Cholissin algebra. And therefore, we get this result and plenty of traces. OK. Now, what can be said from about cyclic cohomology? Let, let's go from traces to cyclic cohomology. And of course, here the question is, the first question is which kind of cyclic cohomology to use? And actually, I mean, for Banach algebras and for the things we do here, there is only one theory which is reasonable because it's quite well behaved for topological algebras and it is often invariant under passage to holomorphically closed subalgebra. This is so-called local cyclic cohomology. So let me <clears throat> comment on this. First of all, I want to recall the homogeneous decomposition of the algebraic cyclic bicomplex of a group ring. This says that the cyclic bicomplex splits as a direct sum of contributions labeled by the conjugacy classes. And this contribution here is given by just by the linear span of algebraic differential forms, G0, DG1 to DGN, such that the product of the group elements sits inside the conjugacy, the given conjugacy class here. And it's clear that these form subcomplexes and that the direct sum of them is the cyclic complex of the group ring. Now we pass to local cyclic cohomology. This means we consider Banach algebras A and B. For Banach algebras A and B, there is an analytic cyclic complex about which we already heard or will still hear something this week. And uh, we now view this analytic cyclic by complex as object in a certain triangulated category. And we take the morphisms in this triangulated category. This gives us the this is by definition the local the bivariant cyclic cohomology. And you see there is an obvious composition product, as in bivariant K theory, just given by composition of morphisms here. OK, now uh, the results we have obtained by using um, the uh, holomorphically closed subalgebras we found. So theorem let gamma be a word hyperbolic group and let A gamma be an unconditional Banach algebra over it. So in applications, this, was, this will always be the Joly saint Hogel algebra. Then the canonical pr projection of the cyclic by complex of the group ring to its direct factor labeled by the conjugacy class G extends to a bounded projection of the analytic cyclic by complexes of this holomorphically closed algebra A infinity. Recall that this was true for the Scholesian algebra if you took the conjugacy class of given by the unit element, but wrong for all other conjugacy classes. So here we found a holomorphically closed subalgebra, which is sufficiently small that this splitting takes place. And after that splitting, we may, as Conan Moscovici did, ask for the site for um, the nature of this direct sum end. And now in local cyclic cohomology, you don't say, you don't ask for the cohomology of this. You want to characterize this as an element in a certain triangulated category. And here is the characterization. Now, suppose we have a word hyperbolic group and we take a Banach algebra, which contains L1 rapid decay. So which is, 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 um, big enough, we don't want the one, but very, very small subalgebras. Then we have the following result that the corresponding factor in the analytic cyclic by complex of A infinity gamma vanishes if the order 
of the group element representing the conjugacy class is infinite. And for elements of finite order, for torsion elements, we see that this complex becomes isomorphic in the derived in category to, to a complex of finite length with vanishing differentials, which is given in degree n just by the nth homology of the group gamma with values in the module, just the linear span of the conjugacy class equipped with the adjoint action. <coughs> Fine. And the last result I want to mention here is that this calculation of the local cyclic homology and cohomology of the algebra A infinity gamma we constructed is quite interesting because the inclusion of this subalgebra in the reduced group sister algebra gives an isomorphism of analytic cyclic bicomplexes in uh, the triangulated category we consider. Yeah? But unfortunately, this is not enough to really calculate the local cyclic cohomology here because the local uh, the, the analytic cyclic bicomplex of this holomorphically closed subalgebra splits every um, summand uh, um, <clears throat> corresponding to given conjugacy class splits off and we co completely control the summand. But the projection operators here, they are bounded, but their norms tend very quickly to infinity when the conjugacy classes become bigger and bigger. So the analytic cyclic by complex here is by no means a topological direct sum of its factors. Yeah? Each of these factors splits off, but, the <coughs> but we do not understand up to now the structure of this one. No, of the, the this uh, analytic, analytic cyclic by complex, which is necessary to calculate local cyclic cohomology of the reduced sista group sister algebra. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michael, for the nice talk. Um, I will stop the recording now.